Roland 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 Roland
and you've talked about creating a zero federal income tax on security and first $60,000 income uh, and also a zero national debt. How would you propose to do that? Sure. So the I want there to be zero income tax, federal income tax on Social Security. It blows my mind that people work their whole lives and they put into this system and then to get their own money back, they got to pay yet another tax on it. And uh, that that is hardly right. Uh, and so the tax plan, my tiered flat tax program actually uh, effectively removes all income tax on Social Security. And then for everyone in America, uh, you do not pay. It would be zero federal taxes on the first sixty thousand dollars that you make. So everyone yeah. who is making under sixty thousand uh, dollars would actually pay zero tax. Uh, and by the way, as we know from uh, the federal Bureau of Statistics that uh, over half of Americans don't pay federal income tax. Now, the problem is, and this is what rubs people the wrong way, is a lot of the people that aren't paying are the billionaires or the uh, Amazons and the Apples and so forth uh, yeah. that because of the, way the tax laws are written. So half of America is not paying tax. The problem is it's the rich half, you, uh, the wealthiest half, and not necessarily uh, and on the backs of those who, who struggle. And so right. what my tiered flat tax program does is it it uh, it's a it's a fair and it's honorable uh, way of taxing the people. It's not taking advantage of the poor. In fact, it's giving relief to the poor by not taxing them on the first sixty thousand. And then if you are blessed enough to continue moving up uh, through entrepreneurship and through uh, your creative uh, creativity and ingenuity and the blessing of God financially on your life, then that's wonderful. Uh, and we move into that seven, a sixty thousand to seven hundred fifty thousand dollar bracket. Uh, you would pay a flat tax of twelve percent on it. You don't have to worry about write offs. You don't have to worry about loopholes. You don't have to worry about anything. Just you know, if if you make seven hundred thousand, you're gonna you've got uh, you know ten or twelve percent of that's going to go to the to the tax. And um, and then over seven hundred fifty thousand, seven hundred fifty thousand to two point five million uh, would be a flat twenty percent. And then there's a flat twenty percent corporate tax. But the point is, it's on. People, uh, it's it's on those that have the money and are earning the money and making the money. And it's not the prohibitive way that the tax code does it now, where the more you make, the more you're taxed in the sense of now we're up into 30 plus percent. And then after the city, local and state taxes, you're up nearly 50 percent in, in many yeah. locations. And so that doesn't work either. The, the argument historically from Republicans has been we don't want to tax those uh, the, the wealthy because they're the ones creating the jobs. And I'm saying if you do it right and you remove the loopholes, it's not going to disincentivize hiring. It's going to highly incentivize it because watch this. If the if the bracket 750 to 200, 2.5 million is 20 percent. But if you take out more, if you get paid more than 2.5 million a year, and uh, then you would be paid to take 30 percent tax on the amount from 2.5 and above. So yeah. if you want to buy a super yacht and you want to take 150 million dollars, Wonderful. We're happy for you. When you t take that earnings, uh, you're going to be uh, hit 30 uh, yeah. percent. Yeah. And so what that does is, uh, Maurice, it incentivizes business owners to not pay themselves more than two point five million in a year. Instead, keep that money, those billions, the hundreds of millions, keep it in the company, keep reinvesting it there uh, and grow the value of your asset, the business. That's right really incentivizes job creation. So that is my plan to uh, relieve uh, the middle class and uh, and below. And then also uh, in terms of eliminating the national debt, uh, debt is what's going to bury my children and yours. Uh, yes. I mean, you cannot breathe. Individuals that are, uh, ha are loaded with debt, uh, it creates stress. It's the biggest cause of divorce, they tell us. Uh, money yeah. issues, which is usually revolved around debt. Uh, and, and, and so that's the place that America's at right now. And what my plan is, is using energy uh, and my education plan, which uh, we, we will get into, and then also uh, uh, using foreign investment, not foreign aid, as a policy. And those three things combined help pay off the national debt without the approval of Congress. And that's the big issue. Because the president is very limited when it comes to the power of the purse in terms of spending and even in terms of allocation of income. But there are ways 
that we can do it. And that's what we've outlined is how we get to a zero national debt. Well, I tell you, it's a great plan. As as we all know, the national debt is just going up right now. Pop, 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 pop. And we're like $17 trillion and counting in debt. So, and it will bury, bury our future generations if, um, it, I mean, we won't have future generations, quite frankly and honestly, if this uh, continues. So, yeah, we need a plan. We need a solid plan. And it, it definitely sounds like you have worked this out uh, because we need an answer to it. It's a serious issue. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Dr. Roland Roberts, who is running for president of the United States in the campaign 2024, an election that's coming up very, very soon. We're right on the very, quite frankly and honestly, when you look at it, we're, we're right at the eve of a, making a decision. Who do we want to run our nation? And Dr. Roberts is on the Maurice Brown Show making a case as to why he should be your man. And I can guarantee you right now, he's got a great plan. He wants to bring God back to the forefront of uh, the American thought process, which is the only way we're going to succeed. Uh, Dr. Roberts, uh, thank you once again for being on the show. You've made it clear that under your leadership, the United States would also have the strongest armed forces in history, which is which, which is quite, quite an impressive uh, idea. How would you propose to make that a reality? How we strengthen our military, first of all, it's been very weakened because we have focused on the wrong things, not because the American spirit has been is diminished. It is that it has been the wrong things have been celebrated. Uh, some of the best people no longer are willing to go sacrifice their lives for an ideology with which they do not support or agree with. They also right. do not what they want to fight to defend America and American values, not fight for other countries. Uh, that uh, they to which they do not belong. Uh, so that that number one, culturally and ideologically, must be fixed. Uh, you know, in times past, our the times when our military was the strongest, it's because we had a president, not because we had a Congress and a Senate and all of the other leaders. Because we had a president that valued the military, that valued our fighting men and women who fought to protect and defend uh, our way of life and our freedom and the liberties that we enjoy here. Uh, and that's what they stood for. And it's what we represented. Uh, we've gotten off base with that. So the first thing is to restore uh, a and, and sense of inspiration and a sense of patriotism uh, for America and that America is worth fighting for and that we will not needlessly and warrantlessly send you to do America's bidding that is not in the best interest of America. And so, uh, but then technologically, that's the first aspect to even help resolving our recruitment issue uh, in our all volunteer army. Uh, the second phase to having the strongest military that our nation has ever had is to leapfrog our current technology. We are still playing checkers while China and, and, and others are playing chess. They are playing, uh, they're fighting numerous wars on, and we're still trying to build up our armaments. One of the, 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 the historians tell us that the fifth reason that Rome fell was they kept pouring in an exorbitant amount of financial resources into building up an armament that was irrelevant at that time. Times okay. had shifted. That wasn't the armaments was not how wars of the future would be fought, but they kept building up for, a, for the past wars, not the way they would be fought. So we must leapfrog our current technology uh, we don't just need faster planes or or pilotless planes that can do this or that. We really need to be uh, hyper advanced in the AI world and the artificial intelligence, uh, yeah. because then you are fighting wars without ever sending anything in the sky. You're doing a lot of things electronically. You're doing a lot of things using uh, the people of other nations and I I ideologies of other nations. Uh, you're using a lot of levers. Uh, it is a lot of strategy. and uh, but I can tell you that artificial intelligence uh, will be the defining uh, factor of the future. There's only been three advancements, major advancements in human warfare in recorded history. Uh, obviously, the rifle and ammunition was one. Uh, nuclear uh, was the second major advancement in human warfare. And artificial intelligence will be the third. And right now we are in a dead heat race 
for which country, and we are within weeks of of where we all stand on it, uh, and we uh, whoever is first to artificial general intelligence uh, will dominate and control much of the world. So uh, that needs to be our military's highest priority. Uh, it was only about five years ago that we had the technological ability uh, to, when we were being hacked, to be able to trace back no matter what they did to know the origin. Uh, yeah. So we've got to move so much past that. Uh, and sometimes, you know, obviously there's a lot of strategy. You, you might know that they're in, but you don't want them to know that you know, so you can plant whatever information. Uh, but we, we must get a lot smarter uh, in how we do it. We're also, it goes to foreign policy. We're, our, our military poli uh, policy, we're listening to a lot of, uh, of wrong voices. And you're only, you can only make decisions based on the quality of input. It's kind of like chat GPT or any artificial intelligent, uh, you know, chat bot where it's only as good as the information you give it. And, uh, and so right now we're getting a lot of uh, uh, conflicting and incorrect uh, summations, kind of like with China. We thought that China was just struggling with democracy, you know, after their liberation in 1948. And you know, it's it's a messy journey. Hey, look at America and uh, our journey. And so it's not exactly clean. So the Tiananmen Square massacre, that's just par for the course. That's going to happen. Right. Until you realize that it's not, that the <laughs> whole strategy is to just not be in your face like America is. So that's how we uh, create the strongest military in the world so that we don't have to use it. I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, there's uh... a... <laughs> A clip from the movie Stripes, uh, where Bill Murray, one of my favorite guys, said, uh, we're 10 and 1. We're 10 and 1, guys. And and he went on with that great speech, which, which was absolutely hilarious. But the point is, the United States has a nearly flawless record on the battlefield. And we know we, we, we had the debacle in Vietnam. But outside of that, and that was a true debacle. But outside of that, we've been flawless. And I think we get lulled into the idea because we are so powerful, we are so strong and have been so for so long that we forget that there are major countries out there that are catching us. Uh, and you, you mentioned China. There's no question about that. Russia's right now made a poor decision to get into something, which could be Vietnam-like for them, but they're catching us. And, you know, I think the United States has to take itself, uh, well, probably I should say stop taking its power for granted because we're being we're being caught and maybe even in some you know respects passed because we're, we may be falling into uh, a, a situation where we're being lulled into sleep. So I, I, I love that you mentioned that you don't hear the, that kind of talk uh, that you're espousing from a lot of uh, would-be leaders and current leaders, quite frankly and honestly. So it's it, it's it's well needed. <laughs> the world is changing. Technology is driving everything. And certainly I would have to imagine the military is at the forefront of the super technological world that we are living in and headed for. So great commentary, Dr. Roberts. Uh, I, I love it. Um, and as you, you have said all of that, uh, it leads me to my next question about the American borders, which has been a real issue over the last three to five years, more so than I can ever remember, at least. Uh, and you've made it clear uh, that you have a strong plan about securing America's borders. Uh, how, how would you respond to that? Well, let me say that it does no good does very little good to secure your borders if you don't fix the problem that's here as well. But you yes. also cannot fix the problem that is here without securing the border. So uh, they both go hand in hand. Uh, in fact, whenever I use the term securing the border, I inherently mean fixing immigration in America yes. as well. Uh, right. So the when it comes to uh, fixing immigration in America, you do have to stop the bleeding at the border first. Uh, or else the internal solution never takes foot. So you have Correct. to stop bleeding. How you do that, it it has never been a question of can we, uh, it's been a matter of political will. Uh, the Border Patrol, they know how to stop it. They know how to prevent it. 
there are many things that we have that have been done to them politically that have uh, strapped them and constrained them, uh, their ability to do that. So that's the number one thing is having the leader of the free world that says empowers them to do what they are paid to do. Uh, We're not they're not paid to facilitate people across the border. They are paid to secure the border uh, and make sure people coming in do have the proper papers and the proper credentials, just like I have to have with every single country I go in uh, throughout Africa or or, uh, Asia Pacific region. I have to have the proper credentials. Uh, and so if, if I have to, I, I, everyone has to, I mean, it's just, that's yes, the absolutely the nation, uh, that, uh, does it even the lawless nations, you have to have your right papers to get into the country, which is amazing. Now, everyone does want to come to America, America. There's still that belief in the American dream. And I still believe that there is more opportunity here than in most countries that I go to as well. So I understand the desire to be here, but you have to come in the right way. Now we haven't. We haven't done right by people uh, in that sense either. Uh, We have people who have spent tens of thousands of dollars trying to come here legally. And we say no. Uh, We say uh, keep paying more and wait longer. And so for years, some of them, 15, 20 plus years are still waiting to become U.S. citizens. So why not just come across the border? Then at least you'll hand me a phone and a hotel and, you know, give me what I need. And, And my kids are in school. I get more perks coming in illegally. That's twisted thinking. That's just like everything else that we, we have going on in America right now. It's upside down. So uh, the, the answer is to have uh, is my immigration restoration citizenship plan. Uh, it's, it's for those who are coming in legally. We have to have a 12 month turnaround process so that you can come in legally within 12 months. If you come in illegally for all those, uh, which is over 30 million, probably closer to 40 million, it's be the second largest city, excuse me, state in the world, uh, in the country. Uh, of illegal immigrants, if you put them all in one state, they'd be the second largest state in the union. And uh, so we have a seven year restoration citizenship program for them if they uh, do not, if they pay taxes, uh, if they're following the tier, the tier flat tax program, if they uh, do not have any uh, arrests and, and issues with law enforcement uh, and they're good citizens, uh, you know, then they're able to become a full fledged U S citizen at the end of seven years. Most of them are already in our communities. They are ingrained in our communities. They have families here. They're in our schools. They play with my children and yours on the playground. They're learning yeah. math and arithmetic and English and history right next to each other at school every day. Uh, we have to stop ignoring people in America. They are living the life of a U.S. citizen and America will be safer and better if we know who is actually here. So uh, we, this is the way to do that. Uh, but also it incentivizes everyone in the future. Hey, just apply for citizenship, because if you apply for citizenship, you can get that in 12 months. If I come in illegally, uh, you'd have to cut. We wait seven years. And after we implement this citizen restoration plan, if you come in illegally, it disqualifies you for U.S. citizenship ever in your lifetime. So it's highly yeah. disincentivized uh, to do it this way. And you've got every reason to just say, I'm here. Yes, yes. Uh, my wife and I watched a film called The Swimmers uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, which talks about uh, Syrian refugee Yusra Mardini, who was able to participate in the 2016 Summer Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, and she won gold. The, the, the process uh, as she was an immigrant from Syria, the the, the bombings and the, the the vision of that nation, the the war torn uh, nation of Syria at that time, and she was trying to get in uh, to Germany at the point, and and at that point, and as you accurately alluded to, it's it's a it's a difficult process, and you may wait fifteen to twenty years before you're approved to to become a citizen, and it's a lot of staying in hotels. They put you in situations where you're you're like in a, a complex. It's, it's a, you know, very akin to like a prison like situation and children involved. It's a very, very uh, difficult situation for a person to have to go through. And there are legitimate, uh, reasonable uh, reasons why people need to get out of their countries and and find, as it were, refuge. Uh, great commentary on your part. We've, we've got a lot of issues on the border right now. Uh, and they need to be resolved. I think what scares me is the children being involved in this. Babies, in fact, being involved in this. It is such uh, a sad 
situation. And I think it can be resolved. I don't think it's rocket science, doctor. I mean, the humanitarian aspect of who, who we are as human beings should kick in and it should be uh, a, a much a much better process that we we currently have. Uh, American Newscape says great interview. Thank you, Kurt. I appreciate it. Talking, ladies and gentlemen, with Dr. Roland Roberts, who is making a run for president. Uh, and he is on the Maurice Brown show. We want to thank you, doctor, for being on the show once again, talking about some issues in America that, that need to be addressed, one of which Judeo-Christian values. Uh, what is your plan, doctor, on emphasizing Judeo-Christian values in our society today? Well, I think the way, the way that we can best promote it is to live it. Yeah. And a lot of what we're commanded is to be, not to impose. So I'm not looking to create a theocracy. I'm not looking to impose beliefs on people or even a standard of morality. Uh, I do have, and I think they're innate in every human being, is an innate sense of right and wrong, of good and bad, of light and darkness. And people generally know that. You don't yeah. have to be a follower of God to know you don't kill your fellow mankind. Uh, yes. or to hate your fellow mankind. That is a value. That is a virtue of humanity. You just don't do that. And, and so you feel people feel better when they help someone. They feel worse when they are hurting people. Uh, and they don't yes. even know sometimes why they feel bad. Uh, but that is why. And so uh, I want to promote it by being it, by demonstrating it. Uh, and, and I can do that in so many ways, uh, just even how we're running for president. Uh, it, it's so easy to go after all of the different things that are wrong about everything and everyone all the time. But we're not demonizing, uh, you know, I'm running on the Republican platform, but we're not demonizing uh, Democrats or independents or libertarians or right. Republicans right. who are behind Trump or uh, behind DeSantis or anybody else. Uh, I, I'm viewing this as a, a unifying campaign. And I'll tell you, uh, my team and I were talking last week. We came to a decision. There was a question that we were debating. And I said, I said, team, this is one of those moments where one answer is here's what you do to win. This is the answer, what you do if you're trying to unify America. And we have to decide right now, again, in this moment, are you going to do the thing that causes you to win? Or are you going to do the thing that unifies America. And everyone will say, every political consultant will tell you, you, you cannot win the nomination if you run to unify America. That's not inspiring to the basis that gets you elected. That's the system that we have. We've made the decision. It is more important that we honor God, even in how we follow this process, uh, by unifying America, not pandering or doing what we have to do to win. And that is how you bring righteousness uh, by living it, by being it, by doing what is right when it is expedient to do what is wrong. Uh, and, you know, it may not work, but I believe that it will have the blessing of God on it. And that's the whole point. There's a lot of things where the natural mind it, with policy will immediately go, well, that won't work. Well, it does if God blesses it, because yes. you see all of the other policy uh, that he's that, that clearly does not have his blessing. Uh, and you keep thinking it's this or that, kind of like even some of our uh, current Congress people that are trying to end uh, birthright citizenship. Well, that's a really bad solution to the problem. Uh, I can appreciate that everybody's trying to solve the problem in their way, but we have to fundamentally solve the immigration problem in, a, in a, an American way, uh, in a humane way, in a people honoring way. Uh, and that mutual respect is what makes America great. That's why they want to stand and fight uh, for America. And they salute a flag and sing the Star Spangled Banner. That sense of this is a country of law and order, and I'm a part of it. Yes. The God of Israel told the people that I will lead you. And they said, well, we want a king like these other guys. So he said, okay, I'll give you a king. The reality is if you follow his principles, if that king follows his principles, since you want a king, okay, but if he follows God's principles, you'll be a blessed nation and you'll succeed on every count. 
And that's what American, I like what you said a moment or two ago about some of the policies that are being passed are not of God, quite frankly and honestly, in our nation today. And he's not happy. And a lot of things have to be overturned and reestablished and relooked at and, and put out in a way that people can understand uh, that this is how things are. This is how things are going to be. This is what we believe as a nation. Otherwise, why are we saying one nation under God? Right. Why, why are we saying that we believe the Bible? And, and you look at the Constitution and the constitutions of the states where the Bible is clearly there and referenced in a lot of laws that have been passed uh, since the, the birth of this nation. And so here we are in 2023, and we're reneging on a lot of what's in the Bible to please the masses. Uh, I, you know, we, our money even says, in God we trust. Uh, yes. But it's actually, you know, the furthest thing from the truth. But it's because we still, we must acknowledge him once again. I, I, you, you're exactly right. That is the crossroads America is at. That's one of the reasons why I believe he called me to run for president, because the 2024 election will be a referendum on God. Either the people will accept him, not, not just me, but this is a matter of faith and politics. Will God be acknowledged in this country again or not? Uh, yes. and, and in my perspective, you brought up Israel and how they asked for a, a physical king. And going back to what I was, my team and I were talking about, I told them, I said, uh, you know, God himself has lost the two elections. He's run, run for office. He's lost both of them. Uh, yes. He told them, he said, I'll be your king. They said, no, we want a physical king. He lost the election. And then the second one was whenever you know, Pilate, uh, you know, they put it out to the people and said, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll give you Jesus or I'll give you Barabbas. And they said, we want Barabbas, uh, yes. you know, crucified. So he, they, he's 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 over two. And so running on doing what is right by people, by Americans and by the nations of this world uh, is not the most popular message in the world. Shockingly. it. <laughs> I love the uh, examples you, you gave there. Uh, which are 100% accurate. Uh, it's unfortunate, but the masses have to be convinced that it it is God. And oftentimes that comes through hard experiences. Unfortunately. Think about 9-11. Think about after 9-11, to your point. Yeah. Uh, after 9-11, for two weeks, every atheist was praying uh, that a, some, a plane didn't land in their home uh, or in their place of work. And their, the, the country was united. Uh, and I... And so, you know, I, I don't want it to take a 9-11, uh, but I do believe there will be some Catholic event prior to the 2024 election. Uh, and it, it will be another opportunity uh, for people to unite. If we can't unite under the flag right now because it, it, it is divisive or what people re see it as representing, we can unite under God uh, when things get bad enough and he's all we have. We will find out as a nation he's all we need. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, I love the reference to 9-11. I remember there was a time, there was a, a moment in America, and it was a long moment where everyone went back to church. We prayed as a nation. We unified. It, it was uh, one of those moments in American history where it brought unification. Uh, it didn't matter what color, color you were, what religion you espoused, what your cultural background. We were all in the same boat together. And, and and then after a while, as we are wont to do, things kind of slowly get back to normal. And it happened to the people of Israel, the children of Israel, if you read the Old Covenant, and they just slide right back into their own way of thinking. And, and so it comes to point, Doctor, where you mentioned before, another, unfortunately, cataclysmic event has to occur to get the people's attention that we need God. You know, we, I remember DeMar Hamlin had the situation, the football player on Monday Night Football, uh, and he had cardiac arrest right there in the field to stop the game. And the, the entire stadium prayed for this yes. young man. Yes. Uh, the home side, the, the, the away side, the nation prayed for this young, this young man. So it, it, it takes tragedies and, and just cataclysmic events oftentimes to get the attention of the masses. I, I tell you right now, doctor, I pray we don't need too many more of those types of things, but America needs to pay attention to what's happening around it. And we need God, I think, more than ever 
in 2023 when you look at what's going on right now in 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 the world with with what's happening within our own nation and i want to say this uh doctor as i i talk about that we talk about education and our school systems uh housing jobs all those different things but i do want to ask you this as we are on the subject do you have a plan to reintroduce prayer in schools? Yes. You know, I want to reintroduce prayer in America. I want to, uh, it's not illegal to pray. Uh, and yes. And so uh, we, we barred God from certain sectors, such as the public school. And yes. we deal with drugs and rape and teachers can't even teach for fear of their own life or for yes. the havoc that it has wreaked ever since. Uh, you think you're solving one problem and you're creating a hundred more. And that's all, and that's the same thing we do with every policy that kicks God to the curb. And so yeah. my, my plan uh, is to allow teachers to make that call uh, if they want. And certainly students are allowed to pray in school uh, and, and, uh, and, and teachers are able to lead in corporate prayer. Uh, but I also think that... Uh, it's interesting because, you know, th there's different people pray in different ways. Different religions pray in different ways. And so um, there's a respectful and right way to do it. Uh, oh, the problem is on some of these topics, people try to be lightning rods. And so somebody pulls, you know, uh, gets down in the middle of a class period, interrupts the teacher and starts trying to pray like Elijah and fire down from heaven, you know, to burn up the sacrifice or something. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's disruptive. That's not appropriate use of it. And, okay? right. and so uh, you have to be respectful. When, you know, as a CEO, I, I obviously was with clients for, for decades uh, and, and prospects and so forth. And every single meal that I would have in public with clients or prospects uh, for the companies uh, or even employees and staff, uh, I didn't impose and say, OK, everyone grab hands. We're going to bless this food before we ate. Right. I didn't right. do that in many settings, uh, depending on the setting. Sometimes I would just bow my own head. And in my heart, I prayed and thanked the Lord for providing this meal for me and for his blessings on our life. And, yeah. uh, and for the, he would just bless that food as it goes down. I need the, all the help with digestion and clear thoughts. All right. So uh, yes, I wanted it to, to nourish me. Uh, and then at the same time, there's other times where I just felt the freedom and the liberty to just ask and say, would you all mind if I say grace before dinner? And uh, I've actually never had someone say no. Uh, they, they've let me say something. And I have respected that. I then did not then go on for 30 minutes trying to call fire down from heaven. I just gave thanks. And so yes. I think that, yes, we want to uh, we I want prayer to be abundant in, in the United States of America. Uh, and I certainly want our students raised in a culture uh, and a habit of calling on God and seeking help and assistance from him, from the almighty. That's where our help and our strength comes from. We must teach that. That's one of the greatest lessons you can teach children. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe that scripture does not teach them that you uh, mandate people to teach reading, writing, arithmetic, engineering, and everything else. It does teach that you uh, uh, c command that you teach right from wrong. And that where the source of all help and having a healthy fear of God, that is all good things. And so, yes, that's exactly how we would do it. I think there's a right way, an appropriate way, uh, a respectful way to do it. I think that the moment we took prayer out of schools is the moment that the school system slowly, methodically and systematically uh, began to deteriorate. Uh, we've seen a more mass shootings in schools. Uh, not to mention in this nation uh, that than we've ever seen. And, and people don't we, correlate those two. They want to go immediately on gun control instead of realizing that when you took prayer and Bible reading out of school, the Bible was the primary textbook in this country for the first 150, 200 years. I mean, that was the textbook. Yes. Uh, it's not history. It teaches science. It teaches creation. It teaches the history of the world. It teaches about outer space and uh, uh, the layers and cores of earth and temperature and environment and animals. And I mean, it teaches absolutely everything. Uh, and, uh, and when you take that and plus the moral law of God, and when you, when you abandon prayer and Bible reading, it absolutely 
uh, has destroyed and it's destroyed homes because then they were unruly at home. The parents couldn't control and they got out of, of uh, the purview and authority of the home and then they are left to deal with law enforcement. And we have horrible problems in our prison systems uh, because of the breakdown of the family. I would totally agree with you. I remember there was a time when I was growing up as a kid in school where I, where I would get paddled by the principal and then another paddling at home. But that's a story <laughs> for another time, doctor. But I, I want to thank you for being on the show. Dr. Roland Roberts making its run for president of the United States of 2024 on the Maurice Brown Show. I mentioned education. Uh, but how do you intend to overhaul housing and the job situation in America? Well, housing and jobs, uh, I intend to fix with education. Uh, and I don't just mean teaching you about them. I mean, literally overhauling the education system fixes the housing and the jobs issue. Uh, we, we must, on the job sector, we must focus on uh, energy sector. Energy technology has been it for the last you know 20 years uh, since the internet uh, became a thing. Prior to that, it was doctor or lawyer, you know, is what everybody wanted their children to be. Uh, yeah. Now it's every it's theoretical physicists, it's uh, chemists, it's uh, uh, the sciences uh, and, uh, and artificial intelligence and so forth. I can tell you that um, overhauling the education system, I want the bachelor's degree in trade and vocational training to run simultaneously and concurrently with high school years, with those four years of high school, so that when people graduate at 18, they are going into the workforce immediately at, at 18. Most of them would naturally do that. That's why they, there's resistance with them going to college right away. Sometimes it was financial, financially prohibitive. Other times we're just innately wired to work. Work is a good thing. It helps yeah. your, your mind. It keeps you off of antidepressants. I mean, when you start early and you work hard, uh, there's a lot of rewards because we are built to work. Uh, and yeah. so uh, I believe that by, by running those concurrently, we solve many problems. But that also frees up now our university and our college campuses. So we have uh, thousands and thousands of dorm rooms available. Uh, and by the way, that's only about to get worse. In 2025, they call it the education cliff because okay. a population uh, declined uh, 16 years ago, 17 years ago, such a sharp decline in the number of Americans having children. And so we've been watching this decline through the primary and secondary schools, and it's about to hit the college campuses. And, okay. and the university presidents are all very aware of this. They've been talking about it for a year. But how do we address the educational cliff that's coming? We have uh, university campuses that are closing right now. I heard about another one just a few days ago. The wow. old, oldest one in the state of West Virginia okay. uh, and just just going under. And uh, and it's only going to be exacerbated uh, over the next 24 months. So we have all of these dorm rooms. I want to use that for military, for vet housing. I want to use it for long-term mental health facilities. We have to have a place, not prison. We need a place for people to get the help that they need. And right now, a third of our prisons, because we don't know where else to put them that have mental illness, they're in prison. And so we need yeah. places like uh, that's long-term mental health. And so I would use university campuses and dormitories for vet housing and for uh, long-term mental health. But that also provides some temporary housing for other needs as the nation needs it. Uh, but that solves our economic problems uh, because uh, and that's how I intend to also pay off our debt is because if I have people in the workforce at 18 instead of right now where they start college when they're 20 and they cram four years into eight and then they spend a couple of years trying to find themselves. Well, they're still on mom's couch at 30 years old before they <laughs> enter the workforce. And yeah. we just lost 12 years of productivity and we wonder why we can't fund Social Security. Or why we wonder why we're upside down. You know, I had I was mowing lawns when I was 11 years old and I was riding my bicycle with a rope attached to a wagon that had the weed eater in it. And then I had the uh, lawnmower attached from the wagon to the handle pulling it. Yeah. It was three, three things at 11 and 12 years old mowing lawns. It, and somehow we've gotten away from that to where instead of people working younger, they were waiting later. But I do believe Gen Z. I'm seeing a lot of Gen Z that are hustlers. They are hard workers. And uh, they want to be productive. And so I think it's just the right plan. It's And I'm the right president with the right population, uh, American population, for to build a 22nd century America. All of my solutions and policies are not how do I get elected uh, in 2024 or how do I get reelected in 2028? My policies are what is best for America uh, now and in the 22nd century. 
I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with Dr. Roland Roberts, presidential candidate for 2024 on the Maurice Brown Show. Um, and, and, you know, and running for president, there's a lot of things involved. There's a lot of uh, meetings. There's a lot of, uh, you know, interviews, a big itinerary for those that are they're making their run for, for president. Um, what's coming up in the immediate future for Dr. Roland Roberts on the itinerary? Oh, we have a couple of big, uh, big events this month. And uh, first of all, we have a virtual town hall. It's the first time that we've seen it done this way where where we can have thousands of people on it. Normally, town halls are, you know, 100 pre vetted people uh, yeah. and sometimes even with planted questions. And I'm just tired of the facade in politics. And I think a lot of Americans are sick of being manipulated by establishment politicians with established by establishment media. And uh, so we just we're, we will be raw. We have a great team. We have we'll have some people who give us 30, 60 second, you know, uh, endorsement that are very notable people. And then I'll just be able to talk to the American people and then we'll take questions. Uh, and so we and then we have an after party after that and that will also have a live benefit for our work in Africa. We've been doing extensive work for years on clean water initiatives in Africa and education for women and youth. Uh, both in entrepreneurship, so they can be self-sustainable, uh, and in literacy. And so uh, we'll, we'll be having a benefit at, during the after party for that. But the virtual town hall is just a raw one-on-one -on -one conversation with America. And so we're very excited about that. That's Monday, August 14th, a week from Monday. And uh, information's at rollandroberts.com about that. Also, uh, on August 23rd, uh, we, will, we are having an alternate conversation with America that night. Uh, with some other presidential candidates and uh, where we will be discussing our vision for America. Uh, my perspective is that uh, the establishment cabal uh, really tries to narrate who will be in the White House so they can control uh, the person. And what several of us want is a real honest conversation with America. We always want, Americans always say, well, why can't we get someone in there who has some common sense? And can just talk to us and is normal. This is why. Uh, but we are we are bucking the establishment and the trend, uh, and that's what that's what you do. That's what we the kind of leadership actually America needs at this time. So those are the two great events that we have coming up, and uh, certainly hope every uh, listener can be a part of it. Well, I, I certainly hope Dr. Roberts to see you uh, doing a debate. Uh, on CNN and MSNBC and Fox and all those major network entities as we get closer to the election of uh, president of the United States, it's, which is coming up very, very, just literally around the corner. Uh, I certainly hope to see you up there talking about how we can reintroduce the father to the nation because uh, we've gotten away from that. We're getting, unfortunately, away from that. Uh, Dr. Roberts, also want to ask you, um, what advice can you leave with young people out there? They have a dream to, to be president one day themselves. What, what kind of a, a advice can you leave with those young folks? Don't follow uh, conventional wisdom. You have a destiny. God has created you with a purpose and with a calling, and you have a destiny. And so my prayer is for every single one of you who, who maybe has birthed the idea of being the president of the United States, follow him. He will guide and direct your paths. I could have never scripted out the path that brought me to this point. I never could have done it. And it was unconventional. Just like Moses, when he was on the backside of the desert for 40 years, he sure didn't look like the savior of, of, of Israel at the time to lead them out, the deliverer. Yes. Uh, and so uh, follow him. And I promise you, he can do for you in your life exactly what he did for Joseph. And he took him from a prison and placed him second in command of all of Egypt, the most powerful empire in the world at that time, in a single day. And he can do the same for you if you put him first. And I, I think it's all about perseverance and how bad you want something. Uh, you mentioned Moses. You mentioned Joseph. Jo two men who were in precarious situations. You would never. The last thing I'm sure on their minds was ending ending up in the great place that they eventually arrived. Also, Yusra Mardini, the young lady I referred to earlier, who's in the film, who, whose story is uh, portrayed in the film, The Swimmers, went from a refugee, had to swim across the, the, the Greek Sea 
and all the different things. And one one night she was talking with someone and she said that she wanted to go to Rio. But she says right now it seems like a very, very far away place that maybe I'll never get to. And she not only got there, she won gold. It's all about perseverance yeah. and how bad you want something. It took 80 years. It, it's persevering and, and in having intentionality and saying no one's going to take this dream from me. This is what God gave me. It's in my heart. And I'm not going to stop until I get there. Uh, Moses, it took him 80 years, 80 years. A lot of time we're in this uh, 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 immediate gratification uh, society of 2023 where we think it's got to happen right now. And, you know, it's got to happen tomorrow. It's got to be, you know, very, very soon. I mean, after all, I mean, I want this really bad. Yes, that's great that you want it really bad. There's a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of patience involved in getting there. But God always weighs the heart. And he, and God knows how bad you want something. And, and when you show him, he'll do anything to get there. He will provide you with your dreams. So, Bruce, the uh, hardest thing in the world is being persistent at doing right and being who you're supposed to be because it's yeah. controlling that emotional roller coaster of doubt and discouragement. I don't think it'll ever happen. And then something happens and you're back on top. And it's that emotional roller coaster. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But it's the persistence of belief. It's the persistence of being who you are supposed to be. Uh, and, and, and just that faith that carries you through being persistent in that is, is the journey. It is. And young people take a hold of that. Uh, there are a lot of talented young people out there, and I just don't want you to lose heart. Life, in, in fact, is getting even tougher uh, as we sit here in 2023 than it's ever been before as an American. And if you're young, it's really hard to imagine that you can arrive at some of the places maybe that you have that in your heart that you want to arrive at. But you, you can get it doesn't matter how hard it is if you really want it. God will provide a way for you. Trust him and keep fighting. You'll get there. Dr. Roland Roberts on the Maurice Brown show, uh, running for president of 2024. And uh, it's been great talking with you, sir. How can fans, voters, follow you on social media or by website? Yeah, connect with us on all of the networks or at RolandRoberts.com. Everything is at Roland Roberts. R-O-L-L-A-N, Roberts, the two L's and no D. R-O-L-L-A-N. I love it. I love it. Dr. Roland Roberts, thank you so much for being on the show. I hope you folks have enjoyed uh, our interview with Dr. Roberts. If you came in late and you're like, oh, my gosh, I, I missed it. I'm like, this is this is crazy. Yeah, but you know what? It's all right because you can watch the replay on Facebook and YouTube. You can also listen to this interview in its entirety on Spotify where all major podcasts are heard. Audible, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, RadioCast, uh, Pocket Cast even. Uh, you can hear the entire interview. And also, every Saturday morning at 12 a.m. in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on KCHFTV11.org, you can see the Maurice Brown Show at 12 a.m. and again at 8 p.m. that evening. And, oh, guess what? you'll see this interview. This interview will be played in about two weeks on KCHF TV. Uh, and if it if that changes, I'll let you know, doctor, if I may try to get it uh, priority for this Saturday, but it will air uh, this Saturday or next again at 12 a.m. Uh, and again at 8 p.m. They love the show so much out there in Albuquerque. <laughs> doctor, they run it twice. So <laughs> you got to love that. Uh, and so, and also we are also on the taken, uh, network as well. So, um, get the app and watch the Maurice Brown show and you'll see Dr. Roland Roberts as well on that platform. Doctor, thank you so much once again. And, uh, we're going to be rooting for you. We need a man of God out there in office. There's, there's no doubt. And one more time before we step out real quick, the two dates, uh, on your itinerary once again. August 14th and August 23rd. August 14th and August 23rd. Uh, big itinerary coming up. There's no anytime you're running for president. Uh, kind of expect a big itinerary. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that, that being said, doc, doctor, thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to be rooting for you. We're going to be voting for you. I'll tell you that. You got my vote, sir. I pray that 
you continue to, uh, to do what you do and, and, and bringing God back to the forefront of America. Uh, may the peace of Jesus Christ, sir, be with you and your family. God bless you. Amen. It's been a pleasure. Every blessing.